Yes, my name is Ed Lodi. Ed, and um, how long have you been in the Hudson Valley? I came to the Hudson Valley uh, in 1953. So that is, uh, I'm not sure, but how many years well, is that? That <coughs> must be about uh, 50 some years. 56 years. And what is uh, your overall feeling to the Hudson Valley? Good question. I love this valley and uh, I've uh, traveled a bit because most people like where they've been or where they were brought up. And I've traveled a bit and I keep coming back here and this is a terrific place to be. It's beautiful, the river is beautiful, the, uh, the whole place is beautiful. Anything in particular <coughs> stand out about the Hudson Valley? Uh, well, I, can't, I can't say anything particular except that I like the topography. You know, like for instance, uh, uh, compared to Florida, which is very flat and boring, this is very interesting topographically. You're driving over hills and going over and underneath things. And the river obviously is a big attraction to the Hudson Valley. I love the river. I lived close to it when I was a kid. I've been on it a lot. So can you describe for me what it was like the first time you, you came across the bridge? You remember what I told you yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, actually, uh, uh, the first time I came over a bridge to Poughkeepsie's when I moved here in 53, and back then, the, uh, uh, the, the approach to the bridge was different. There was a, a, a road much closer to the river, and you took a very sharp left turn to get onto the bridge. So when you finally saw the bridge, it was in front of you like this. And uh, uh, I, I never, to this day, forget that. And every time I come back to Poughkeepsie from the other side of the river, I imagine that the, it's almost like the first time I over, went over it. Uh, then I have another view in my mind of, of the railroad bridge, which when I was about 15 or so when I came here, I lived near the river. And I used to look up at the river at this bridge and uh, it's 200 some feet above the ground and so I remember seeing a small train and they travel very slowly across the bridge because the bridge was designed to support uh, trains, but, but uh, the impact of a train increases as it speeds up. So the trains had to go slowly and this train basically crawled over, in my mind, over the bridge and it was filled, it was a lot of flat cars, all filled with construction equipment, all painted orange and yellow, back holes, front end loaders, track holes, and, and I still to this day have a picture in my mind about that. Mm, great. So what brought about inspiration <coughs> for you in some of your designs for the bridge? Well, I really only have one design for this bridge and there was only one particular inspiration. I also remember that very well. It was in 1978, about 30 years ago, that I, uh, for some reason, happened to be down by the river looking up at the bridge. The bridge by that time had already uh, been defunct for four years because there was a fire on that bridge in 1974. And again, I'm looking up at the bridge and saying to myself, it's a shame this bridge. I don't see my little train over it anymore. Mm -hmm. There's nothing going on on this bridge. And then bingo, a light went off, <clears throat> like in the cartoons. The cartoon thing about the light over your head, you know, that's a perfect, perfect icon or description of what, what it means to get an inspirational thought. And I didn't see a defunct bridge anymore. I didn't see a bridge that was uh, half destroyed or on its way to its makers. I saw a building half built. I saw a building, don't forget I'm an architect, so I, I'm thinking the foundations are here, the site's here, the structure is here, everything is here. We just have to add the walls, the, floor, the floors, the outlets, the lights, whatever. We have a building half done. And uh, that, in, that got me to hustle back to my office and make a drawing, which, which has been kicking around here now for 30 years, of what I pictured this could have been. Um, 
I'm, I didn't get this from yesterday, <coughs> so I'll ask you a brand new question. About the fire, um, did you see the fire? Do you have any recollections? Do you remember what the news coverage was like? Uh, uh, the only thing I remember about the fire, Jason, was that uh, I saw the newspaper. I was not down by the river at that time. I, I, uh, I, I have pictures in my mind about newspaper articles and smoke com coming off the bridge. Frankly, I could have seen those pictures five days or five months later, but I was not there when this happened. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that your background is in architecture. Can you kind of just briefly describe some of uh, what that background entails, what interested you in architecture, just so we can create a profile of you? Well, I, um, my mother says, because I don't remember this far back, but my mother says that when I was about four or five, I used to steal all my brother's building blocks and, <clears throat> and put them with mine and I was always building things and she always encouraged or she saw an architect and she was right I mean this this was a long time ago and uh, she encouraged me she never told me I should become an architect she never told me anything <clears throat> but she did encourage it always supported it and I liked it and I, I do like it it's very creative and I like art and I like to paint I like to sculpt too like my friend Peter uh, even though he, I think, sculpts more than I do. And uh, I uh, also like technical things. I like math. I like geometry. <clears throat> Particularly love solid geometry, where, and which is really architecture. Architecture can be described really in solid geometry. And so those two things, art and, art and the math, the technical part together, I've come to realize over the years is what you really need to become an architect. You need to have a... Uh, facility with both of those disciplines to feel comfortable as an architect. And I've had that since I was a kid. I went to school in Pratt at uh, Pratt and Institute in New York uh, back in the 50s. Uh, graduated from there, got my license, and been in private practice since 67. Uh, it's uh, uh, about 40 years now. Can you describe to me from an artistic point of view, because I think you're an architect, form of art. When you get <coughs> an idea into your mind, can you describe for me how you go about pursuing, from, an, the, from the point of view of the artist, <coughs> how you go about pursuing a project? <coughs> well, um, depends on what, when you say this idea, our projects always start off with a client. The client could come in here and say, um, I need to uh, extend my warehouse another 60 feet, and I know exactly how I want it. There's this and this, and, my, and you know, any idea I might have <clears throat> is like out the window. There, there's no idea that goes with that. But then you might have clients who come in and say, you know, I'd like to have, uh, uh, let me just say a house, but it, it could be a club, it could be a church, and someone who doesn't describe that, their ideas that, that specifically. And they come to an architect to ask to do something that goes beyond just be my drafts person to draw up what I have in mind. I think you might relate to this in your work. So what, what I like is somebody comes to me and challenges me is, you know, here's what we like to do. We'd like to do, uh, let's say, we like, we'd like to have a church here. This is our congregation. We have just so many dollars. What could you do? <clears throat> so now it's up to me to deal with, frankly, I have to deal with financial matters. I have to deal with technical matters. How big is the site? How do I get water to this thing? How do we get rid of the waste? Is the parking lot big enough? And then what I'm really in this for is how can I give expression to the structure? In this case, being a church, I picked that on purpose because that at least has an obvious spiritual quality or, or side to it. How can I express this structure where people are going to be in it to do something they usually do, they don't do all day long, they're, they're going to be in their spiritual uh, uh, situation that day. And how can you give expression to that in the structure? And the structure consists of steel and wood and concrete, you know? It's like a musician in a way, you know? How are you gonna describe Romeo and Juliet having this 
tragic love affair, and you got clarinets and pianos and violins. How are you going to do this? So it's, it's somewhat like that, but we're very technically rooted. When it's all done, it has to stand, it can't collapse, it can't leak. The door's got to be able to be locked. The waste's got to be able to go out. You've got to be well, hot water there. <laughs> it goes on and on. So it's a complicated thing. There are no child architect prodigies. The damn discipline is too complicated. So that being said, <coughs> could you walk me through, and I, I granted you don't have the, well, I guess you have the painting up there. Could you walk me through that design a little bit? Well, I came up with that idea uh, 30 years ago, <clears throat> and I took a photograph of it. Uh, actually, when I was there, I didn't have a camera, and that, this is 30 years ago. Now I have a little pocket camera, bingo. So I ran back up to my office. I think I got a Polaroid camera, which in, back in those days was the instant camera of the day. And I took a picture, and you, it would come, zzz, would come out and put it in your pocket and get nice and warm. And about a minute later, you peel it off and you have a picture. And I took that picture, I had it enlarged. And, um, uh, but at first, I just took the small picture and sketched my idea over top of it. I came up with the idea that this could be basically almost a city over this bridge that would have housing on it, it would have uh, uh, businesses on it, museums, sporting facilities, ability to get someplace with a boat. Uh, I had the idea of putting a, a extra train stop after the Poughkeepsie train station so you could uh, get off the train not only at Poughkeepsie, but at Poughkeepsie North, like they have in White Plains, and that would take you straight up into this bridge. Uh, I, I saw a complete self-enabling uh, uh, structural entity that would support housing, businesses, uh, entertainment areas, restaurants, bars, you name it, anything. And frankly, you can do anything you want, even to this day. The mixture of uses there really does it could vary all the time. So could the design of this. So could the visual picture of this vary. Imagine this <coughs> thing was completed. How do you think this thing would impact um, Poughkeepsie, Hudson Valley? Well, in my opinion, this, this, my idea, if it was completed, and the way I see this, and by the way, I'll back up a little bit because I never said I would just want to do this. And let's say I was, uh, uh, who is that fellow with all the money? There are a couple guys, Gates. If I was Gates, I wouldn't go out there and just do that because Gates could literally write a check for this. My idea all along was to make a, a feasibility study that, that we would study the structurally, legally, environmentally, economically, any which way, and if the study would would uh, permit and affect this, the outcome of the study was such that it made sense to do it, then, then you'd have the people there willing to finance it. That's how all this works. So based on a study that would say this would work and you would execute this idea, I think it would be just a, another wonder of the world. People would come here the same as they would go to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower, they go to India to see the Taj Mahal, they, they go down to uh, 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 Rio de Janeiro to see Sugarloaf uh, with the Christ statue up on top. If you ever saw a picture of that, I mean, that thing is like about 600 feet up in the air. I mean, these are the kind of things that people were willing to talk about even if they've never, never been there. And most of them don't get to see these things, but they, somehow they get the humans, human beings get excited about things that are extraordinary. So that's what I think. This would have put Hudson Valley on the world map, not, not on the New York State map, on the world map. How is your design received by business community, by political <laughs> community, by? Oh, that, that's a good question because frankly, uh, officially, the, the uh, and when I say officially, at that time, the Poughkeepsie Journal carried some articles and the basic attitude was that this was something that was just too big, it was just nobody could grasp it, it was a little crazy. I mean, who needs to go shopping up on a bridge when we have plenty shopping centers down on Route 9 
and who would want to live up there and so on. It was not well received. Now, among many of my friends who would just talk to me on the side, they would say, hey, this is crazy, this is a fantastic idea and so on. But uh, it, it was probably received kind of like the Eiffel Tower when, by the way, that was built for an exposition. And when the decision came along to keep it after the exposition was over, then how was that idea received? Everybody in Paris said, what are you nuts? You're gonna keep this here? You gotta knock this down. This is the ugliest thing that was ever built in Paris. And uh, you can't keep that here. And I don't know the details of how it ended up staying, but it stayed. 100 years later, they say, oh, that's the greatest thing ever happened in Paris. But that's, that's how humans are, you know? A change is difficult for most humans, and if something's been around long enough, guess what? Then it's a good thing, you know? Why do you think Italians love some meatballs? And, and like Hungarians like a goulash, or, or the Hindus like cow flops, you know? Not because they studied this carefully, they just do what they've always done and they're stuck on that. So if you can change it, well, if you manage to change it 100 years later, you might have Indians eating meatballs and Italians eating cow flops. I don't know, but I swear to God, I bet you that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think so, <laughs> right? Great. Um, can you tell me some of the benefits that, this, that would come if your design or something similar to your design was implemented? Well, to go back to what I said, in order to, come, to get to my design, it was my idea was an idea at first, and then I realized, because I'm, I have one foot solid, maybe more than one foot solid in the business world as an architect and a builder, so I realized you can't just build something like this without understanding the financial and economic impacts. Would this have come to fruition, as I said earlier? be a fantastic thing here. I mean, there are thousands of people who would have jobs. This would be a fantastic tourist uh, attraction. Uh, I mean, aside from what I've already said, you could take a train from this place to New York. You could take a car to New York. You could take a boat to New York. You could take a helicopter to New York. I guess you could walk or swim to New York if you had the time. But, I mean, it's just a fantastic place. You could have windmills on it to generate power. You could have underwater turbines that take advantage of the, of the tides that go in and out because the Hudson is half a river and half a fjord. You know, if you know what a fjord is, is that uh, over in, in, in the Norwegian area, there are these mountains, have all these crevices. Well, when the tide rises, the water rushes into these valleys. Well. You get salt water coming all the way up to uh, Newburgh. You get seagulls nowadays, even get them up this way. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to en uh, capture energy, solar energy. I mean, th this, this could be a fantastic, by the way, completely self-supporting uh, uh, place to live. You can anchor a couple, I'm going to say warships. Uh, I don't know how your feelings about war or not war but there are plenty extra warships around that nobody needs. You can put one there as a museum. Uh, you could anchor, uh, you could have regular uh, boat trips back down to New York like they used to have in the old days when I was a kid. You can get onto one of these boats and take you to New York, New York and back. Uh, you can have bungee jumping contests. I used to, they, people would say to me, Lodi, you're crazy. What's with this bungee jumping? But you know, bungee jumping, what's different from bungee jumping from, from, from for instance, uh, speed skating or downhill skiing? It's a sport that uh, downhill skiing has been around a long time. It's, it's somehow prestige accrued to it. Guess why? Because it's been around a long time. Bungee jumping hasn't been around that long, right? But I mean, is it any crazier to come down a goddamn mountain at 65 miles an hour on a pair of wooden sticks than jumping off a bridge on a rubber band? Uh, frankly, I think it's safer to come off the bridge. At least you know you're going to stop. Those guys coming down those mountains, you, you never wonder how they're going to stop. So uh, this, this could have been a fantastic. And by the way, I don't rule it out altogether yet. I mean, the walkway is in the works right now. But uh, I, I suggest that it's possible that the walkway people will find out something I've said all along. 
the most expensive part of that bridge is the maintaining the structural integrity of it, which requires its continuous painting, which uh, I've checked just very recently with New York State Bridge Authority, and I was told, and they didn't tell me to quote them, and I'm not quoting them, but uh, they said $30 million just to paint this bridge. That would need to be done on a continuous basis. How do you pay for that? Do you charge the average person walks across with the family and it's, yes, sir, uh, $615 for your ticket and your kids go half price, that's $312 for those two kids a piece, and so on. You, you can't do that. So who's going to pay for painting this bridge? The taxpayer is going to pay. Now, my idea called for no taxes. The idea was this was a business that everybody had to carry its, his or her or its weight. So I'm thinking that if this walkway takes off, that's terrific. But it might just so happen that at both ends, or maybe even on along the whole walkway, somebody's going to say, listen, I'll pay you guys uh, $200 a week for, could I put a hot dog stand here? Or McDonald's say, look, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you a million dollars a year to put McDonald's down here. And Marriott might say, I'll lease this spot over here for $18 million a year to put a hotel here. So before you know it, you have my idea on the two ends, subsidizing the walkway, and then in some fashion, this thing might just start crawling all over the bridge and end up looking like something like I had in mind. I mean, it's not to be ruled out, because at least that'll pay for it all. Otherwise, we all, as taxpayers, have to pay for it. What's the other thing you mentioned yesterday that would be advantageous to your design is in relation to the concrete and the steel. Could you kind of talk to me about that <clears throat> as well? That's a very good point. Uh, what I just said earlier, the, the maintenance of the structure as it stands right now requires continuous painting. Now, t painting sounds easy. You just get a brush and go like this. But uh, 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 not in today's time when you have to be so careful about polluting things and God forbid this little speck of dust falls off the bridge and you got to catch it and all that. So now, if you ever watch the way things get painted on bridges, and if any of you have driven through bridges, you see these gigantic machines on the side, and you get these big ducks, and as you go by, it goes What they are is like gigantic vacuum cleaners on wheels. And anything they do, any brushing, scraping, goes straight into a vacuum cleaner, so you, when you scrape that bridge, you can't have any dust fall down, any rust fall down into the river. God forbid, some fish gonna swallow that, he's gonna do something, before you know it, you're cooking that fish and you're gonna have a brown spot on your face because you ate that piece of rust, whatever. But the idea is that you can't paint bridges like you used to. You have to go through this process of protecting the environment and it's, it's, that's why when the fellas told me 30 million bucks for that, I said, you know what, 50 is probably more like it so my idea of building this structure was to use the existing bridge structure to support it all, but would be totally encased. Totally encased in such a way that none of the steel is exposed to, con to the weather anymore. Consequently, you do not need to continuously maintain it. So this would be a big saving. So if you think just on the basis of that, you save yourself $30 million, maybe let's stretch it for every 10 years. I think it's more than that. So $3 million a year just in maintenance, you save that. Right, great. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of switch a little bit because I want to start going into talking about your, the process of you getting, meeting up with the different people and then getting up into uh, the point where you eventually had to walk away a little bit. So could you talk about the first time you started pursuing this vision? See, I'm glad you remember all this stuff because yesterday when I was down there, I told, it, told them everything. And here are, here's a big component of, of my story where I at first came up with this idea and for about 10 years, I viewed myself simply as the idea guy. And I frankly did nothing else about it. I said, hey, you know, people said, hey, that's a neat idea. I said, yeah. And I was waiting, maybe somebody pick up on this idea. 
about 10 years after that, I was on a beach and it was down in the Bahamas on vacation with my family and my 18 year old old boy and I were on the beach and I'm trying to teach him lessons about how to deal with life that he was about to start to confront. And I said, you know, if you want to do something, the way you go about that is you put that in your head that I'm going to become uh, a movie maker, I'm going to be a concert violinist, I'm going to be whatever, and you put that in here and you focus on that and you just stay with that and if that's what you really want to do, you just say to yourself, I'm going to do it and you will end up doing it. So the kid and all his brightness as an 18 year old kid turns the tables on me and says, oh yeah dad, if that's all there's to it, why didn't you do this bridge already? So I said, well, that's a good point. But I said, this, this is a big deal, Lork. I said, this is not just becoming like a, a violinist. He says, yeah, but you said whatever it was. <laughs> so I said, okay. Well, by the time I came back from that vacation, I'd made up my mind to do just that. I said, 10 years went by, and I could nothing happened, and nobody seems to be interested. I think still it's a good idea, so I'll do it. So I started calling the owner a fellow named Gordon, I think, Schreiber Miller. And uh, I had met him once before, but I know he was difficult to get a hold of. I made up my mind, I will take my good old time. Uh, be patient, call them once a week, call them for a month. This lady always answered the phone with the same thing, I'm sorry he's not here, sorry he's not here. I was very apologetic about it, so I didn't need to bother him. I, uh, uh, would like to speak to him if he gets a chance. And I would always say that. And, and I was playing my game. I knew sooner or later I would get to her, and I did. And after a while, she started to become my friend. And she started to feel bad that Gordon wouldn't talk to me. And it turns out later that she was his lady friend. So I had an excellent end. She finally arranged for uh, me to meet Gordon. And uh, I met with him because Clearly, the thing I had to do is to have a right to that bridge in some fashion. I might not have to own it. If I owned it, that was one thing. If I had the right to develop it was another thing. I was a partner with him to do things would have been another thing. Even if I had a limited time to do something on some agreement, I had a right to that bridge. I needed that in order to to basically make my idea stick with the people I want to talk to. Because, you know, I could say to you, you know what, I want to paint the uh, Eiffel Tower pink. And you would say to me, yes, yeah, so what, Ed? Uh, uh, you got any other good stories? But if I told you that, you know, we just acquired the rights to the Eiffel Tower and we're going to paint it pink or we're thinking about it, they're going to say, oh, you have rights here? Yes. Yeah. So that's a different story. So anyway, I tried to convince him and I tried to persuade him to, to make some kind of a deal. He had this bridge for 10 years already, hadn't done, didn't squat with this bridge, Connect, collected about $10,000 a month for two years from Central Hudson because they had lines over the bridge, power lines. <clears throat> they caught onto his deal quick and they put their lines on the water. So that, that fell through. So after that, he had no income. So I said, well, Gordon, um, maybe you think my idea is a little pie in the sky, which he always said, but I said, what ideas do you have? And he didn't have any. <clears throat> well, he wouldn't make any kind of deal with me, and I became frustrated. So I said, okay, there are other ways. Uh, there are always other ways, by the way. And that's so how I came back, and he hadn't paid his taxes. He had been totally delinquent, wouldn't even bother to keep up navigational lights on the bridge, which were a safety matter. So I made an arrangement with the county through my attorneys. We formed a corporation called Skytrax Inc. And we formed the corporation, made a deal with the county so that they would foreclose on the bridge. And we would then be assigned the county's rights, which in effect would then give us control over the bridge. Now, interestingly enough, you wouldn't ask, but I'll tell you, we're only talking half of the bridge <laughs> because the county's right stopped in the middle of the river. I had that going though, they agreed. So I went across the uh, river and made my same uh, plea speech to Ulster County. 
Well, they listened very politely and they entertained some letters from my attorneys, but they didn't act on that. So now only I have this one bridge, one half of the bridge. And then this was about 15 years ago. And there were some tough economic times around that time. And uh, I had so many things on my plate that I had to deal with economically and financially and frankly, even domestically with my family that this had to go a little on the back burner. And during that time is when the county was proceeding ahead with the foreclosure on the bridge. And when the newspaper got a hold of that, uh, of course, everybody got nervous. Who's buying this bridge? And there was, my name wasn't connected. Who's Skytrax? What's this mysterious firm? And little by little, this boiled up into something where uh, the county felt the pressure and did to renege on their deal with us. Uh, we had a right to sue the county, but I never pursued that. So there was my second chance of getting a hold of the bridge. So a little time went by, and uh, maybe a couple of years, and um, then I was remarried. It's a completely separate matter here, but during that time, I had a great advocate, my present wife, and she found out about this, and she said, well, why don't we talk to this guy Gordon? I said, well, I've already talked to this guy Gordon. <clears throat> well, let's talk to him again. I said, okay. So we started this whole process again, making phone calls and so on, which went a little easy this time. I was able to get a hold of Gordon, went down there, had another meeting with him, and lo and behold, would you believe he agrees to a deal? Yep, I forget the details, but we had a deal where we had a right to develop, at least go through the process of doing all the due diligence, all the, all the uh, analysis that was required to see if this whole idea made any sense at all, which I was not going to bother to do without having a right to the bridge because an analysis like this is a little more than analyzing if you had enough money in your pocket to go pizza that night. So he said, fine, we come back here. I instructed my attorneys to prepare a contract to send it to him. They did, never heard from Gordon again. And you know, by this time, we're now about 20 years into this thing and I'm getting a little tired. So I actually at that point start putting, stop putting energy into this uh, found out that he handed the rights over to a Vito Moreno. Vito Moreno was a partner of his, but had nothing to do with the bridge itself. Vito was given his bridge just so Gordon could get out from under dealing with the Coast Guard, who was now breathing down his neck to make sure he put the proper lighting on it and who knows what other requirements from him. I, I heard there was some $150,000 in fines involved and Gordon's way of dealing with this, same as he bought it for a dollar, he sold it for a dollar, and now Vito had it. And Vito was his straw man. He made it clear he could control Vito, and Vito now was hiding the bridge. And Vito did call me one time, he needed some help from me because the local disc jockey wanted to hang bras from one end of the bridge to the other, uh, to deal with some breast cancer thing, which I think the idea was fine, uh, but I was getting to the point where I wasn't going to be involved anymore, and all the local, the local attitude was, you guys are crazy, you're nuts, all your bridge people are nuts, this broad thing is the last thing we want to deal with, so uh, I declined to assist, and then um, the next part of the story is kind of interesting. Vito, for unknown reasons, decided to give the bridge to Bill Seppi, who has been coveting it all along to put a walkway on it. And he did do that, after which Schreiber calls me up and says, Ed, I need your help. Vito gave my bridge away. <laughs> and I said to Schreiber in so many words, you know, Gordon, it's too late now. 20 years I've been dealing with this, maybe more. I said. I don't care. I don't care what happens now. I said, my idea is coming on and I'm out of it now. So uh, that's how Bill Seppi ended up with it. And that basically describes my 
attempts to get a hold of the bridge and my inability ultimately to be able to get a hold of it. Um, just for purposes of color, could, uh, could you describe what um, <coughs> Gordon Shriver Miller was like on a personal level, on a one-to-one -one level? He, he was a very interesting guy. I actually only had two real good meetings with him and each one was at a restaurant down in King of Prussia in Pennsylvania, and each, each lunch was probably about two to three hours long, and we ate and drank, and it was just a wonderful meeting. I mean, as, as meetings go, <laughs> they were perfect meetings, but as far as results, no good. Uh, he was an older fella, and uh, I say older, I mean, uh, at that time, I thought he was older, but uh, he was colorful in that sense. I, I didn't have a whole lot to do with him. He's written me some letters uh, for somebody who was uh, uh, claiming to be involved in big deals like buying this bridge from Conrail and doing, having investors to deal with it. His letters were always handwritten, very scribbled, all over the place, a little difficult to read. Uh, but. Uh, I can't say I know a whole lot more. Uh, he was a fun guy to have lunch with, though. Do you have an opinion, an opinion why he might have gone uh, towards Vito Morgan or Moreno <coughs> rather than stick with you? I really don't know. I think I, I will venture this guess. Vito Moreno was in his pocket. So by giving this to Vito, he felt he didn't give it away. Vito very much surprised him when Vito then gave it away. That's when he called me, got all upset, and wanted me to help him get it back. I, on the other hand, uh, wasn't in his pocket. He and I disagreed all along. My plan was, I think, too big for him. His, uh, he was forever looking to make a buck there. And I think his vision of making a buck was, can we rent it to somebody to run wires across it? Can we hang bras across it? Can we get bridge uh, bungee jumping off it? Uh, if he was here, he might say something completely different. I don't know. But he and I didn't see eye to eye. That's why we couldn't ever make a deal. Um, did you ever have conversations or meet up with Vito Moreno yourself? Never met the man, spoke with him. Uh, he made me agent for the, I think, what they call Railroad Management Association. I have a document in my files that says Ed Lodi is here by the agent for this outfit, but uh, I don't know what that meant because I don't know what they meant. I don't believe for one minute it would have been honored by anybody if I'd walked into the mayor's office or the Dutchess County Executive's office with that paper they would have probably very respectfully said, because they knew me, said, well, Ed, this is very nice, but uh, we don't know what this means, so I'm sorry, we can't help you. And can you tell me about your relationship with Seppi? And yeah, Seppi and I met uh, first time probably um, 25 years ago and came into my office. I had this, this picture, which you have a copy of, behind me, <coughs> and he sat there. And he was a good boy. <laughs> and he said, I'd like to talk to you about this bridge. I've been, I've been <laughs> the bridge guy for five years of, at least by now. And he explained to me his idea of a walkway. And, you know, to me, doing a walkway there, I would compare, if you had the New York Philharmonic at your disposal that you ask him to play Happy Birthday or one of Beethoven's symphony. So, I didn't think he was taking advantage of the opportunity that was there. And I basically explained this to him, and he was nice, he left. And we've had other talks since, but he decided to make me an adversary. He just could, he, I, I think after a while he got upset with me. I don't know why, I never got upset with him. Maybe he felt that uh, I, you know, I should have thought more of his walkway idea. I told him, I said, why don't we join up and I'll design you a walkway that you can't even imagine, because the walkway that's being proposed is fine. And by the way, I have nothing against this walkway. But this walkway is you get on one end, and if you've ever seen any uh, visual uh, renditions of this, which nowadays is very easy to do even with a computer, it's almost as if you were a bowling ball sitting in a bowling lane and you're looking down like this, and that's it. Now, 
obviously that's where not where you want to be looking because the views are fantastic any which way but you just keep walking and the views after a while you know I don't know I, I, I haven't walked over that Peter Salas walked all over that but the the uh, idea to me wasn't enough. I said, look, I'll design your walkway. It'll go over the bridge, it'll go through and come out the other side and go up and down. You can stop for a hot dog. You can go to the movies. Uh, you might be so busy, you'll never get to the other end the first day. Well, this did not entice Peter Seppi as far as he was concerned. I was crazy. Frankly, did not really want to talk to me a whole lot about anything. Peter Sala can tell you some stories about that separately about how much Seppi, what he thought of me. <laughs> Let's see. Um, you told me an anecdote story <coughs> about the bridge yesterday that confirmed that your father had known about the bridge or studied it back in uh, Hungary, I believe it was. Well, my uncle was an engineer in Budapest. And he came to visit here in the 60s. And at that time, I was aware of the bridge, but I, I had not had my idea. And he enlightened me about the bridge. He said, hey, do you realize that this bridge is world famous? I said, no. He says, we studied this in engineering school in Budapest. This is the longest and biggest bridge that was built at the time in the whole world. And so uh, that was just an interesting little story that, uh, you know, 25 years later, or. 20 years later, whenever I finally had my idea, I, I realized that here's another little thread that goes into this story about my uncle who knew all about this bridge because he never knew about my idea. He passed on by that time. But that I felt was a, I thought that was a very interesting little story. That's why I told you the other day about it. Anything else you'd like to tell me about the bridge or? I'm just trying to think of it because yesterday when we talked, <clears throat> he didn't ask me any questions yesterday. I just sat down and, and like he said, I ranted for an hour and 15 minutes. James was there, right? And uh, uh, I have to confess, you know, I'm, I'm not in the business of being in front of all these, all this paraphernalia. That's a new word now. You guys catching on to that? And all this paraphernalia is used for many other things, that word. And so yesterday it all came flowing out of, out of it me. It is flowing out of you. Well, it is, you know, in a way. But one, there are a number of reasons, because you and I met more than once. I wanted to make sure that I met James and Jason. Uh, I, I wanted to do that on purpose. Uh, Katie, I just met, but she's a very nice lady. She keeps <laughs> smiling on occasion. I can tell I'm doing okay when I see her smile. <laughs> And Peter, of course, we go way back, so I feel comfortable. But if I tell you what, if I was on NBC, it would be a different thing. I'd be looking at all these strange, and, and I'm not used to this. So yesterday went a lot smoother, and he didn't ask me one question. I told him all this day, the questions he's asking, Peter, you know why he's asking those? Because I told those things yesterday. <laughs> if, if I had to think of that stuff right now, I said, oh, geez, I don't know. Look at it. What's this doing? <laughs> so, so uh, I'm just trying to think of what else there might have been. I think we covered Seppi, we covered Gordon Miller, covered the, the idea. Okay, there's <clears throat> one little thing that maybe we should add. Um, after I had come up with this idea, I realized that there was such, such a thing as London Bridge. Now London Bridge, back in about 19, no, 1750s, they literally built a bridge across the Thames and they made it into a city block. They didn't just build a bridge to travel over. They built houses and stores and these, I'm talking five, six story buildings. <coughs> and this was actually a complete city block. So there was really like a city within the city on a bridge. Uh, there are also other bridges around uh, there's the Ponte Vecchio, which is in Italy, which is a three-story high bridge, which has residences and businesses on it. <coughs> so, uh, and recently I had read someplace that somebody somewhere is trying to encourage the idea of using bridges for more than we use them for. That rather than just build all that infrastructure, which is dramatically expensive, just to 
accommodate vehicles and traffic, you might just as well go on and for a minor additional cost, add the shops and the dwellings and all that to it and, and use these bridges for other things. And frankly, down the future, I think these things are going to happen. So uh, I think that's an important thing also to, to think about, to put this idea of mine in perspective. Uh, I guess over 30 years, I've had so many people tell me I'm crazy that I'm, I'm looking for things <laughs> to kind of shore up my idea. Um, just a couple final things. You've done fantastic. Great uh, interview. You, Great just, interview. you would just want me to buy a beer. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, we're going to do, buddy. You're coming, right? <laughs> we're going to get that for class. <laughs> it's too late, kid. <laughs> we need to stick around. you got to do Peter here. Oh, yeah. Let me ask you. You can cancel me in there if it's too late. Yeah. I know. <clears throat> I, got you. I got you. Go on. <laughs> Let me ask you, do you, what do you see is going to be the future of the bridge? Very interesting question because I have a little picture up there which Katie, I think, should uh, photograph. Do you see the picture in the bottom right-hand corner there, Katie, the mm -hmm. black and white thing? Mm -hmm. I see the future, and I hope this isn't going to happen. I see two futures, frankly. Uh, the future I see right now is with the Dyson Foundation behind it and with the, U, uh, with the New York State Parks Department behind it, I think it's possible that this bridge will be saved and will be at least used for a walkway. And so I see that as an immediate possibility for the future. About five years ago, I saw a different thing. I saw the weakest link in any chain is the smallest little thing. When that breaks, there goes the chain. And if you take a look at this bridge, in the very middle of it, there's this small little link that is hung between these two gigantic cantilevers, and there it hangs. And if you take a look at that picture I prepared, it, it basically imagines that that fell out. And I, I imagine this, that at some point, if something's going to give on this bridge, that piece is going to fall out. And I, got, I just got a little angry, and I took the damn thing, and I sketched, and I said, you know what? When that happens, you might just as well make a sculpture out of this thing. And I said, guess what? Make a dog out of this side and a cat out of the other side mm -hmm. and have them looking at each other, and I'll be happy to give you that sketch. You can, show, you can see what I'm talking about. And it was kind of like a frustration that I had with the fact that for, by that time, for 20, 25 years, nothing had happened with the bridge. But, you know, there's always something you can do with everything. So uh, that was a little idea about the bridge. But uh, as an aside, or maybe not an aside, I have a limited, I have a, a number of numbered prints of this bridge in color that I have on a very selective basis given away. On occasion, somebody offers to buy one. But when I give them away, I usually make them very personalized and I have, uh, for instance, a friend of mine who owns BTM here in, in Dutchess County or Herb Rettler who owns businesses. I have given them drawings of this bridge, which I personalized by making it look like it was their headquarters, Rettler World Headquarters or BTM World Headquarters. And I would add, like in case of BTM, a lot of little pieces of equipment around. And, and so that they have it hanging in their offices for like a fun thing, you know, I'm their friend and it's something to look at. And uh, frankly, I think one day there might be a, a, a group of people who, before I kick the bucket, maybe I'll give away another 30 or 50 of them and maybe they'll get together on occasion and compare their pictures. Mm -hmm. That might be kind of a fun thing for them. Um, Am, do you have any questions? I thought it was a Democratic donkey. <laughs> well, maybe that's what it should be. Maybe it should be an elephant and a donkey. But at the time, I thought of a cat and a dog. Do you see it, Katie? Mm -hmm. It looks. Yeah. Like, I mean, it took me about a minute and a half to draw it. So I didn't draw. I, I didn't try too hard, but I think I captured the oh, idea. Yeah. One other question. Um, yesterday, you kind of showed me a couple of other designs. Like you had a colonial one. Can you talk about that, perhaps? Well. I showed you a little sketch of an alternate visual image of this bridge. The whole idea behind that, Jason, is that my concept doesn't really is not rooted in that particular drawing. It doesn't have to look like that. 
It's as if you took a beautiful woman and you said, look, there are 20 gowns you could put on. So any one of those gowns could be put on that woman or any one of those she could wear. So this could look any number of different ways. If you gave this project to 20 good architects, they're going to come and you gave them the basic part that we want to use this structure to support your plan. They're going to come up with 20 different things. They're all going to look different, but does not for one minute take away from the basic idea. So that little sketch I had <clears throat> uh, meant to illustrate that, that this idea did not really depend on this particular architectural language. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad you liked it. Peter, what do you think? I'm going to get caught now. You think I'm? I'm going to do it after the way you did. <laughs> <laughs>